Greetings, everyone. Uh, time for us to move on a little bit with our rereading of Search for a Nonviolent Future. And uh, today we come to what has always been, for me, one of the most compelling and illustrative uh, moments, episodes, in the history of nonviolence. It takes place in Birmingham, Alabama in 1964 during the American Civil Rights Movement. Of course, when there was a march uh, by uh, mostly black marchers, it was part of the voting rights campaign, and they unexpectedly found themselves blocked by police and firemen who were uh, well supplied with their fire hoses and so forth. And you probably have seen that these things could really deliver pretty devastating effect. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm so interested in this episode, there are several actually, but possibly in the long run the most important is that it uh, does away definitively, if you think about it logically, with the argument that nonviolence is weak and it'll only work against weak opposition. That's a devastating argument if it were true. Fortunately, it's the reverse. The fact is that uh, early researchers into nonviolence, like I'm thinking about the 1930s and people like Richard Gregg, they coined a term moral jujitsu because the idea was that the more power the opponent came at you with, the more you could use that power to reverse his or her position. Uh, again, you're not against the well-being of the person, but you can use his or her power to dislocate what he or she is trying to do. So in those days, we called it the moral jujitsu. I guess people don't do jujitsu much anymore. Anyway, today, the more relevant term for it, the more current term for it, is the paradox of repression, where the more an opponent tries to repress you, the less successful he or she is going to be, if for no other reason because of the uh, blowback of the uh, uh, moral repugnance that people develop about that repression. But there's a, more deep, there's a deeper dynamic reason for it too. So what happens here is uh, the marchers are suddenly blocked and it looks like they are thwarted and uh, they do what they do in those situations. They kneel down on the hot sidewalk to pray, and suddenly as they're praying, we have this precious testimony from one of the participants. It is as though they became spiritually intoxicated. And uh, I don't know exactly what that means, but I do know that it is very important for developing a nonviolent response. So uh, this is, again, another interesting thing about this is it is a group phenomenon. We're going to be talking later about how it also was from deeply within the individual person, so an example of person power, but spontaneously, without anyone giving an order or direction, they got up and they walked into those police and firemen. And uh, the segregationist police commissioner who was there gave them the order twice, turn on the hoses, turn on the hoses. The firemen couldn't do it. Uh, it's as though their hands were frozen on the, novels, on the nozzle of their hoses. They couldn't do it. Uh, they were repressed, as it were. Uh, Gandhi will call this later uh, forcing their higher judgment to be free. Uh, we, it, it, no one again explained this to them. It wasn't a conscious decision that they made, but in the face of those marchers coming at them, they simply could not fire their hoses at the marchers. So uh, both dimensions are interesting. How does this arise within the people uh, in an event for which they had not prepared? And then how does it affect the other person, the opponent? So in this little episode, you see, as it were, a cameo of the entire story of nonviolence. At the time that I wrote uh, the book, I was describing this as a peak experience. That was common language used for it in those days. I don't know what people would call it today, but uh, uh, I think if we just let this thing sink in, it will help us to understand the dynamic of nonviolence, the rest will be just a question of how to build that out. Thanks for listening.